coming up on the Knowledge Industry Podcast. You're taking your audience on a journey with your content, and a lot of that journey needs to feel like the bet. Well, the best way to create engagement and to create interest is to give your audience the opportunity to feel like they're a fly on the wall in your life. Have you ever thought about the story your social media profile picture is telling? I mean, what pictures do you use on your website? John D'Amato is a photographer and a visual story expert. He's used his background in television production on the Maury Povich talk show and his photography skills to mix imagery with storytelling. He also has an online course teaching people how to take effective photos of themselves. So how should you be using photographs and images to tell your story? Do you sell online courses or run live workshops? Do you have expertise that can help people in life or business? Are you even running an online training empire from your kitchen table? Then you're part of the knowledge industry, a fast-growing industry that means that you can learn almost anything, and anyone can create a business around what's between their ears. Welcome to the Knowledge Industry Podcast with your host, Mark Egan. So, John, great to chat to you. Where exactly in the world are you right now? It's good to be here, Mark. I'm in uh, New York City. I am in uh, Queens, New York. You know, I, the very before I went to New York for the very first time, I flew. I can't remember. It was at another airport in the U.S. And I sat beside a woman who was from Seattle mm -hmm. and I was really excited to go to New York for the first time. And she basically spent the whole trip saying, I really don't know why you're going there. People are so rude. They're so unfriendly. So I had such low expectations when I got there. I absolutely loved it because I was presuming it was going to be a complete hellhole. And it was great. So uh, I'm very yeah. jealous of you. Yeah. So we actually come from a very similar background because, you know, I, I used to work in television. You worked in television yourself. So what's, tell me a bit about you. Where, where did you kind of start off in this whole kind of media career? Well, it started off in grad school uh, or in college and then in grad school where I got a MFA in television production. And uh, there was just something about cameras that I was drawn in by. I mean, actually, what it really was is I wanted to be a sports announcer when I was in high school. I thought it was cool. And um, I figured, well, if I'm going to get into sports broadcasting, I might as well learn about the production side. And then that's when I started to think to myself, you know, this camera stuff's kind of cool. I kind of like it. And when I went to grad school, the idea of doing announcing went away and the idea of doing something in production. The reason why I went there was because I wanted to kind of go through all of the different things, live event and single camera and documentary style and all of those different things. And ultimately, a year after I graduated with my degree, I started working on Maury, the talk show. And uh, I was there for nine years. And eventually, I just kind of burned out from it because it's a pretty intense place to work and you know while on the side i about five years in i started uh playing around with uh my digital camera that i had and i started finding a lot of uh peace with that creativity it was being energized and fast forward a couple more years and i quit my television job and i figured you know what i'm gonna pick up that camera and start making money off of it and that's where it all began it's obviously gone all right for you. But I mean, we're going back to when you're in that job, because for a lot of people, working in television is their dream job. It's something, you know, if you have that job, you, you damn well, you hold on to it. Yeah. Um, what was it about that? Was it the fact that it was repetitive? That you may, what, Did you lose a sense of creativity? Or was it just that Maury wouldn't leave so you could never get that announcer on screen job? <laughs> I don't think I would be a very good Maury host, but... Um... No, it was a combination of all of those things, and and really, what the the straw that broke the camel's back was when my mom was on her uh, way out, she had cancer, and you know, I just had this kind of moment of clarity in my mind that I knew that there was something missing in terms of you know why why I I'm I exist, you know, like what's my purpose, and I kind of realized that. I was leaving a lot on the table by doing the same thing over and over again. And don't get me wrong, there was a lot of benefit to working on that show that actually influences the work that I do with my expert clients now. But, you know, it kind of felt like a factory after a while. And we're peddling in a lot of emotion. And 
I have to tell you, you know, it's emotional for these people on camera to find out some of the worst news they could ever find out about their life. But, you know, listening to those stories day after day after day, it took a toll on me and I knew I needed something else. And were there any of those particular stories or examples or moments that you just look back and that kind of sums up, it sums it all up for you? Maybe one guest or one show that you just thought, hmm, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. Oh, I got an iPhone full of stories that I could tell you that. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> that, I'll, that I'll, I'll pull up a seat. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what it is? It's just, I mean, at the end of the day, there is, there is a, an interest in these kinds of stories. It's very compelling. They're all very emotional. But it's just the, the sum total of all of them, day after day, month after month, and year after year, just, I, I, I and, and, and it's kids, you know, after a while, you can only kind of compartmentalize your emotions and the work for so long before it bleeds. And that's, that's really what happened to me. Uh, it just was a bit much. And that's why I had to kind of really, and then again, of course, the inspiration of, you know, what am I doing with my life? You know, you put those two things together and the next thing you know, you jump out a window and you start a business when you never wanted to start a business because your whole life, or at least my whole like young adult life into my career was, like you said, TV. It was like, I'm here. This is awesome. Millions of people watch this stuff. It's it, There's something cool about it. And there's an energy to the, to the stuff I was shooting, despite how, you know, emotional it was. There was a charge to be able to capture that moment as it's happening because it's not like you can replicate that kind of emotion again so yeah. i mean i'm very interested in the transferable skills bit which we'll come to in a minute but sure. i completely understand you know obviously very sorry to hear about your mother and that would have really been a moment where you thought you know life is short do i really want to be doing this so that moment when you thought actually i'm going to leave this job what was that like what was your kind did you have a master plan or was it just I'm jumping, I'm going to see what's going to happen. <laughs> I had no plan. <laughs> I had, um, I'm going to be absolutely impulsive and completely lose my mind. And, and that was it. There was something that happened at the office and I just had that, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. And that's it. And so, I was terrible. Please tell me you did your Jerry Maguire thing where you kind of, well, I've had enough of this and you stormed through the office um, in a real kind of made a big scene or did you just not, kind of slip not, out quietly? Not that I want to get into the details of it, but uh, yeah, yeah, I had that moment. Oh, thank and, you. And, 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 least, and, and I'll, I'll fill in the blanks for you. Don't worry. I've, I'll create a heroic <laughs> scene in my mind of you storming out of the Mori Povich uh, production offices um, and the, off to start a new chapter in your life. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was memorable. Let's just say that. And, but I will say that you know. Uh, we left on good terms, the executive producer and I, you know, we were good. I was good with everybody. It was fine. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, absolutely terrifying for the first, I mean, if I said year, year and a half, I'd probably be even too short on it because I had no skills with respect to running a business. Sure. I could pick up a camera and make something happen, but I had absolutely no idea how to do anything. And it was, um, and I didn't know where to turn at the time either, because I was unaware of all of these different communities, you know, even the idea of network and well, what the hell is that? You know, you're going to go into a room with a bunch of strangers and you're going to try to strike up conversations. I barely want to do that with people that I know for God's sakes. Now you want me to go and, into and course, a room and do that? Yeah. It, yeah. They never teach that stuff at school either, do they? You know, you, you think you're, you're taught, you know, how to study and get a job, but you never taught about how to run a business and network and in you know, how accounting works or anything like that. Or because so, I was in the not, same boat. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not even those skills. It's emotional intelligence. It's resilience. It's the ability to, you know, take rejection on a minute by minute basis and handle that. You know, you never taught any how, how to how to uh, how to build processes in your business and your workflow so that you can optimize your time to be able to do things. I remember I ran into someone who is a uh, processes and systems expert. I'm like, what the hell do you do exactly? And now I know what she does because I had to figure it out the hard way. And, 
you know, once you kind of get the momentum rolling and kind of get it, get it, get it moving, get the train actually on the tracks moving forward, you know, you kind of can start to do it. But I'm, I'm, I'm seven, eight years into this business life and, you know, we're still figuring things out. And that's what I realized. There is no mountaintop moment. There is no, okay, I know everything. I don't need to do anything else. Here we are. You know, it's a constant evolution in every single area of your business as well as your life because as a, you know, solo business owner, everything is weaved together in my world. So that that's the really interesting part. It's challenging and it's frustrating and sometimes overwhelming, but the the fulfillment level can't get it while you're working for someone else. So that's part I'm extremely grateful that I gave myself the opportunity to discover that on my own. Yeah, I mean, I I went through a similar process. I remember the book, The E-Myth. I don't know if you've ever read that, where it basically explains the difference between having a passion and making that a business and actually being the owner of a business. And I, I realized, oh, yes, so that's kind of what I'm doing wrong. Um, but what you did, because uh, you moved into, you know, photography, maybe a bit of video production, and then you segued into what you're doing now. So tell us a little bit about what that what happened there. What was the the change and why did you make that change? Well, for the uh, for the first three years, I was flapping around like a fish out of water, basically, essentially being a jack of all trades and a master of none. We, you know, I shot corporate events and video, like you said, some video production at the time, like small little teaser videos or promo videos for small businesses. I'm shooting, I'm shooting uh, like bar mitzvahs and birthday parties and family shots and just all of these different things. And and I refer to that time as my creative crises because I knew I was getting, I was getting work and, and every year the income was increasing uh, a little bit every year. And that was fine, but I didn't feel fulfilled. It didn't feel right. And I would spend a ton of time looking at what other photographers were doing online and kind of like, I could do that. So let me go on Craigslist, find someone to shoot and let me recreate that. And it was fine. You know, you learn the nuts and bolts, you learn the dynamics of working with people in front of the camera and all of that stuff, which is valuable, but ultimately it wasn't where I wanted to go. And then I met a woman at a networking event who was a personal branding expert. And she saw some of the photos that I snapped from that event that started a conversation. That conversation led to me shooting a a one day event she had, which then led to further conversations on the phone about what I was doing. And at the time, I was kind of trying to figure out how can I apply the things that are in my life that I like to shoot and create something for a, a group of people that that would benefit them and also create that opportunity for me to feel as an artist that I'm, you know, achieving that level of satisfaction with my work. So she was putting out a book and she needed a social media presence and she needed a a photo for the cover of the book and she wanted all this stuff. And she's like, well, what kind of photos do you think I need? And then I started thinking about the stuff I did at Maury and, you know, the B specifically B roll. You know, left, right, up, wide, medium, close, tight, visual variety from all different angles. So my editors had, you know, enough stuff to create something compelling with the interviews we shot on the show. And like, I can do that same style with photos and they can use it to kind of pair up with their content that they're creating. So she liked the idea. We did the shoot. Her and her husband are a team. They put together my first website. And the next thing you know, I'm shooting branded lifestyle portraits for speakers, authors, coaches, and consultants. And that kind of started the brand to serve experts. And, you know, that was now late 2016. And I started that aspect, that niche in 2017. Because, you know, if you, anybody goes to look at your website, um, what I really like about, you obviously have a kind of portfolio of, of, of examples. A lot of photographers, you know, I don't mean to be mean, but have you ever seen that scene on, remember the film Zoolander, oh, where yeah. he has this kind of one look and they go through the calendar and it looks like pretty much the same shot with just like a different shirt on or whatever. Sometimes you look at photographers thing and it's, it's almost like they've got kind of one or two tricks and just whoever turns up 
that picture is going to look the same with the same kind of side lighting or whatever. What yeah. I liked about your pictures is each one was very specific to the person. Um, so what is that? What, I mean, how do you define that? What is that process you're doing as opposed to the photographers? And I know there are very good photographers out there as well, but I do see a lot of um, portfolios where it is basically, if you want this picture, but with you in it, come to me. Whereas yours specifically is, if you want a picture that reflects you personally, come to me. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I noticed within the expert space in terms of their photography is that there's a lot of beautiful work out there. Uh, the, the work is wonderful. But in, in, in my estimation, uh, you know, dealing with these experts and talking to them and all of the different research and, and working with people over the years, I realized that, you know, pretty photos aren't enough. Flattering photos are important because if they're not flattering, you're never going to use them. You know, that one look, or if it's like a shot where it looks very like straightforward and, you know, they're not going to use those photos if they're not flattering, but that is not a um, objective. That's just the prerequisite that photos also need to be revealing and inspiring and relatable as well, because those are the stories that my clients share with their audience. They don't just share sunshine and rainbows, big wins every other day, aha moments, oh my God, my life is amazing. They also talk about when they've been knocked on their ass and how they got up because that is an important lesson to share as well as, you know, whatever their flavor of transformation is for those that they serve. You know, they're talking about a variety of stories that fall across the emotional spectrum and my job is to capture a portfolio of images that reveals all of these emotions and through their facial expression and their body language. But it's not just about that. It's also about the fact that in order to create relationships with their audience so that these people are drawn in more to their world so that they can uh, qualify them and figure out if they are, in fact, the solution to their problems, you got to show them how the sausage is made. And that's why these experts need to show what their processes look like, what work looks like, what it, learning from them looks like, whether it's on a stage or in front of a room or if it's on a screen or if it's through their book. We need to see what those images are because it's not enough to just talk to talk about how you can help people. You have to show them what it looks like. And that's a huge component to what I do with my clients. We figure out what their day to day looks like in business and in life. And we capture those candid images that will bring that home for people. So it inspires their audience to stop the scroll and actually read the content and follow through on the call to action. And it's a good example of that whole idea that sometimes people don't realize the skills they do have, the value they do have. And, you know, you worked on Mori. And one thing I know we knock some of these programs, but, and feel free to dis disagree with me, but even the most kind of tacky, cheesy programs, the people behind them really understand storytelling. They really understand how to um, create a story arc, how to get people to kind of, like you say, relatability, how to get people to connect with people. So in a sense, you put together your love of photography with those skills. Would that be a fair thing to say in the sense that um, everything you saw w from that show you learned from, and then you did the photography. And then you just thought, actually, if you bring these together, then you're not just another photographer along with lots of other photographers. Yeah, that, that was the, that was the linchpin to making this whole branded lifestyle portrait thing come about. And then, in, and then moving forward with the virtual photography, it's the same thing. Anytime that there's a person in front of the camera, the goal is to capture various ranges of emotion because that is what hooks people. Because now I need to ask you about that virtual thing. You can't let you skip over that because I lo I absolutely love this when I looked at your website. Is of course with COVID lockdowns, it's not been easy to go out and take pictures and wander around people's houses and get up close and say, "Come on, you know, smile for the camera." Um, and so. A lot of photographers have really, really struggled. Um, but you came up with a solution to that, didn't you? I came up with something, yeah. And it was born out of a need of what my my people had at the time, which was they lost their stages and it was replaced by a screen and I followed them. And essentially what I did was uh, capture images of people 
on screens with their presentations or their masterminds or their consultations or what, whatever, whatever the case is, because each expert has different ways that they leverage the virtual platforms and, you know, create a shock sheet around that, that illustrates the experience through these photos of what it would like would be like for someone who was on the other side learning from them. And that's what I did. You know, it was simply a matter of getting used. I mean, it was weird. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Was, I never thought in a million years I'd be shooting a laptop screen to make a living off of it. But the skills were transferable because at the end of the day, it's a stage. Even though it's a laptop on my folding table in my apartment in various rooms of it as I'm rolling around on the floor shooting pictures of it, it's still relevant and valuable because those photos allowed these people to promote themselves so that they can get work during a really difficult time. And that's what ended up happening. And, you know, now social media is really important. I always think in the past, celebrities had to operate in a certain way. Now, pretty much everybody has to. And I'm as guilty as anybody. I, mean, I traveled around the world doing all sorts of exciting things. And then it came to putting some pictures on a website and it was like, I don't really have any photos of anything, you know. Um, so, because you need to show your story, like you say. So what are the common things you think people are doing wrong? You know, when you look at their social media presence, you look at their images, what, what, do you, what are the main things people are doing wrong? Well, the main, the main thing that I see a lot of people do is that they put too much of a focus on looking good in the photos and not bringing any soul or substance to the image. And... Like I said before, flattery is important, but there has to be something else to it. One of the other things that I see is just a lot of the staged aspect of some of these photos feels like it's outside of the personality of the person delivering it. It feels like the photographer prompted the person to shoot those images in that way. And it's not really germane to that person's um, sensibilities, but they did it anyway, and it's cute, and they think they're going to get really good likes on it. But it does, it's async there's an asynchronous kind of uh, vibe between the image and the person. Uh, and another thing that I see that absolutely drives me crazy is when people unnecessarily break the fourth wall for no reason whatsoever. You know, it'll be a shot where someone's on a computer and they're holding like, you know, a cup of coffee or something. And then all of a sudden they just look up and they're looking right at the camera for no reason. It's like, <laughs> it's like dude, those stock you... shots where you oh, like... just caught us at the moment. <laughs> it's like, oh, hello. It's like, no, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't like those because there is this sense of, you know, look at me, look at me, look at me for no reason. You know, just shoot a photo of yourself working like intently or reading something with your own body language and posture as you're doing so, you know, react to what you're reading, laugh, make a question, questioning face or uh, anger or whatever. But don't look in the camera with a fake cheesy smile and break the fourth wall for no reason, because at the end of the day, you're taking your audience on a journey with your content and a lot of that journey needs to feel like the bet well the best way to create engagement and to create interest is to give your audience the opportunity to feel like they're a fly on the wall in your life so that it gives them an entry point in there which motivates them more to engage ask questions follow up which ultimately leads to them getting on the phone with you and booking you for whatever service that you have to offer them now, I'm immediately going to go and check out my website and delete any pictures that match that description. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you, um, you obviously help clients, you take pictures, you work with them creatively to tell a story across different platforms in different ways, visually. Uh, but you also teach. Um, now, is this is something people say a lot, don't they? They say either you've got the eye for photography or you don't. It's not something that can be learnt What's, what's your take on all that and what, how do people learn from you? Well, with regards to an eye, it can be taught. The, the, all of it can be taught. The question is, do you have the passion for it? If you have a passion for it, you're going to go down that road. It's not like when I look at photos from 15 years ago, 
you know, it looks exactly like what I shoot, I'm shooting now. I mean, there is always an evolution. There is, again, there's no mountaintop moment here with, um, you know, I know everything I need to know, I'm done. You know, it's a constant work in progress, especially when you're talking about art. Um, and as with respect to how I teach people, uh, I have an online course and the course is geared towards people who want to take high quality self portraits of themselves because, you know, as a business owner, you need to be able to share these moments that matter in your life that will resonate with your audience in, in, in order to create, you know, help f nurture that relationship you have with them. But you don't always have a professional photographer around you 24 seven. So as a result, you need to be able to empower yourself to pick up the camera and take photos, but not just any old, you know, self portraits where you're flapping the camera around and hoping for the best, you know, with a couple of, uh, simple, uh, foundational pieces to creating a well-composed image, you'll be able to elevate the artistry in your own photos so that it will complement the professional photos that you have and be able to stretch out those professional photos because you don't have to use them every day because you'll have moments from your own life. So that's what the shoot it yourself course does. It gives you those, those foundational principles on how to be able to take really nice photos with your phone. And what was the, the process of doing that? Because you've got years of experience and you're possibly trying to teach people who may be fairly new to this. What did you do? How did you decide what to leave in, what to leave out? How, how am I going to make this with video? What, what was the whole process of putting the course together? Like it was, it was, it was kind of difficult. I'm not going to lie because I, you know, some of the stuff that I could say, will just, go right over people's heads because, you know, the it's that, that knowledge and experience. So what I ended up doing was I, I got it down to nine modules and as, and I wrote it, I wrote the whole script once. Then I went through it and thought to myself, talk, talk to people like as if they're five years old, talk to people as, is this for a five-year-old or am I going too deep? If it's too deep, cut it out, cut it out, cut it out, cut it out, cut it out. Less is more, less is more, especially with something like this. And then the next thing was I recorded the audio and shared it with a couple of non-photographer colleagues. I'm like, does this make sense? And the feedback was very positive. So I knew I was on the right track and then I finished it off and now it's done. Okay. And um, coming back to, because we can kind of pull these together in a way, because a lot of people who are trying to leverage their expertise, you know, coaches, course creators, they also need what you're offering, which is the, the visual branding and all that kind of thing. So what's the process? So if somebody is there, they've got some expertise, they're thinking, I need to position myself in the market. I want to sell online courses and do coaching. What would be the first step that you would say they should be taking? Well, the first step, well, with regards to getting photography to promote themselves. Well, in well, a sense, you know, possibly even before that, so that, you know, you bump into somebody say, look, I'm like you, I'm leaving my corporate job. I might have an expertise in this, that, and the other. I'm going to try and turn that into a business. You've done this. What, what would your advice to them be? Well, the first step would be to have a brain dump, massive, massive brain dump without any restrictions whatsoever. Just get it all down. And then the second step would be to go in and highlight the key elements to be able to create some type of a framework. Because one of the one of the challenges that I had was even though this thing, this concept of shoot it yourself seems very linear, it's not it's not linear at all. Um, so it had to become linear. And as a result, for anyone that's putting together their own course, they really need to be able to find those high level bullet points that can become the spine of the entire program. You can fill in the details, the anecdotes, the examples, all of the different things that you need after, but you have to have that spine first. You know, it's kind of like when I was producing shows and, and writing uh, writing scripts. You know, it's the same thing. You need your beginning, middle, and end. Then you need those pieces in between, and then you fill out everything else. Um, it's it's challenging. 
But I think if you start with a simple brain dump and just allow all of your expertise to come out and overwhelm yourself for a day and then go back to it and then start parsing out the nitty gritty important details and then be able to explain those details and concepts in a very simplified way with non uh, industry related jargon, you know, you could use the jargon, but be able to define it very well. That's when you have something you can work with. And can I just ask um, if you're able to share it? One of your clients, um, could you talk us through a story of, you know, maybe one client, what they did and how you were able to translate what they did, their business, their process into something visual? Sure. And I do that with all of my clients and it all starts with a strategy call. There's a pre-session strategy call that it's about 29 questions, I think. And what I'm trying to do is high level figure out who they are, who they serve, what problems do they solve, how do they solve them, and why do they do what they do. Um, so that it's, it's a bit of business, it's a bit of life, it illustrates their day-to-day -day activities, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. Now, obviously, there are commonalities among all experts. You know, we work on computers, we work on our phones, we, you know. Uh, work on tablets and all, all these different things, but we don't really, go surfing. Yeah, no. <laughs> Although I've had a client that has done that. Yes, that and that's exactly things like that. It's it's about finding the wrinkles and the nuances in that expert's personality and disposition and the way they live their life and what's important to them and what they are willing to share online and then put together a shot sheet that illustrates all of these different things. Now, of course, we also need headshots. We also need looking into the camera portraits because we need those promotional images, profile images, things like that. But it's the lifestyle component that really brings the juice to the table because that's what separates you and creates distinction from other experts in their spaces because it's their life, you know, the way they hold their hand and the pen that they use and the stationery they write on and all of the little objects in their offices that have emotional significance to them that they can write about that will relate to their audience or the onboarding gifts that they give their audience, you know, or their clients when they come on and all of those little props and things and, 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 and just those little, the way they brainstorm ideas. Do they look out a window? Do they do the coffee cup thing? Do they go walk around the park? You know, once you get all of those little nuts and bolts together, all of a sudden you have yourself a very, a very compelling and unique story visually that you could share to complement visually to your stories that you post online. And of course, you've kind of done that yourself, haven't you? Because you have you know, created this niche where there's a demand, people want their stories told and everything, you've been able to do it. But you know as well as I do, I mean, we were geeking out before we started the recording about old cameras in the background of your office. There are a lot of people who have video production companies, videographers, photographers, who are really, really struggling right now and possibly thinking, well, there's lots of students coming up and they're willing to take pictures or video for no money and there's no future in my skills. You've obviously been able to say, actually, let's look at my skills. Who are the most valuable to? And just adjust it to basically offer more value. So what would your advice be to someone who's listening to this, maybe has sometimes similar skills, but they're really struggling right now. Lose the scarcity mindset and stop worrying about competition because it doesn't exist when you position yourself in a way that makes you uniquely you. Those are the two things that took me very many years to figure out. Um, once I decided to stop paying attention to what every other photographer was doing, I put the blinders on and that's when everything started to click for me. At the end of the day, you need to have, and this might sound, you know, very fortune cookie wisdom -y, but at the end of the day, you do need to believe that what you do is unique and it has value to people and the way in which that you disseminate that value through your expertise, as well as your personality, because, and that's one thing I'd also, um, throw out there as advice for videographers and photographers looking for work. It's that, you know, you have to be in a mindset that you can be able to break through because your personality is something that is marketable because people 
hire people, not just what they can do. So as a result, really impress upon people through your content and the way that you position yourself online and in personal conversation, you know, who you are, because people are qualifying you left and right at all times. And, you know, you need to give them that, that opportunity to truly understand who you are and how you do the work you do and the type of person that you present yourself to be. And final question, because I've probably gone a little bit over time, but I'm really interested in what you're talking about. Um, this whole kind of both, both the expert field, which is people using their knowledge and expertise, you know, and the online learning space, both are predicted to grow massively. So firstly, what's your predicting where all this is going and yourself, what's your plan for the next five years? Do you have a kind of a roadmap or do you just go wherever it takes you? I, I, I'm not a big five-year plan person. But I do have a vision, and that vision does involve doing more online courses as well as building a community around it and kind of building that up and offering other types of ways to help people who want to improve their self-portraits. Because at the end of the day, um, I want to be able to kind of uh, create opportunities for myself to monetize my expertise in a way that does not involve a camera in my hand every five seconds. Not that I don't want to do it, not that I'm uh, unconditionally in love with what I do, but you know, at a certain point, it's going to become a little difficult uh, diving in between cars in New York City traffic, shooting people running around and doing all that stuff. So I want to be able to do that. And I think that the online space is only going to go up because if the pandemic has taught us anything, there is a lot of opportunity to grow and expand to do different things in your life simply by tuning into things on your screens. and. It's a it's a great way for people to kind of figure out the life that they want to live. So I think in all areas, online learning is just going to continue to grow. Well, you're sitting in an office with a sailor's hat over one shoulder in the background and a Viking helmet in the other. So you're clearly living your best life. I don't think you need to worry <laughs> about that. Um, so finally, I'm sure, you know, you've aroused a lot of interest in what you do. Um, where should people go to find out more about you? The best place to go would be my website, johndamato.com. And there, my social links are on every page. You can follow me there. And if you're interested in learning about what makes a compelling visual story, I have a blog. I write about, I write three times a week. So I pump out a lot of stuff and uh, you can sign up on my, on my website and uh, save you the commute to my blog. I'll send it right to your inbox. Great. Right. Well, I love the pictures that um, I've seen that you've taken. Many of them I've actually seen just by the by and then, oh, you took those. Uh, but I also like the whole kind of mentality and thing behind it. So congratulations on your success. Wish you even more in the future. And I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's great. If you want to get started showing up on video and sharing your expertise, head over to markeganvideo.com to access some of my free training. Don't forget to join the Knowledge Industry Group on Facebook and if you want to connect, head to markeganvideo.com.